I'm turning to Matthew chapter 21, and I read from verse 33 to 46. Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 33. Listen to another parable, Jesus said. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people, producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Matthew chapter 21 begins with Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the final week of his life. No more would he travel through the hills of Galilee, and no more would he speak to those in Samaria and other places. Jerusalem was his focus, and he had arrived. Jesus would yet minister rich words of instruction, both for those at large who had ears to hear, as well as for his disciples. But there was an unmistakable target. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, who had frequently followed him and tried to trip him up, they were there and they heard Jesus' words and they knew exactly who he was referring to, though somewhat veiled in a parable. I have just read for you the parable of the landowner and how rich the parables of Jesus are in meaning and how they strike the target. Here is a parable well known in in its imagery to the people of Israel. Often Israel is regarded through Old Testament and New, it was regarded as the vineyard of the Lord. We go to the opening chapters of Isaiah, for instance, and Isaiah, 700 and more years before Christ was born, he is talking about Israel as the Lord's vineyard. So the people, they perfectly understood that the covenant people, the Jews, that they are are meant when Jesus refers to a certain man who had a vineyard. The man was God the Father, who had brought to himself the people out of Egyptian bondage, and he had planted them in the land which he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs. They are there. And here, Jesus, he refers to the great landowner 
who planted that vineyard, and he had done all that he could do, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, and he rents it out. Now, I refer to this message as wretched renters, quite a title. Wretched renters. Each of us, I suspect, have at one point or another, for long or brief time, have been in the position of being a renter. And we could complain about the landlord that we have had, that he or she was utterly careless in their upkeep of the facility, of the, of the apartment, or of the building, of the house, the duplex, whatever it was. And so certainly the complaints can go both ways. But then also there are those who have been excellent landowners and landlords, and there have been those who have been excellent tenants, who have been just a dream to have as renters. But, of course, there are those who have been utterly wretched in their care for what they have rented from someone else. Here Jesus, he's speaking about wretches, wretches who have come and they have rented that which is not their own and would never be their own. They were simply paying some money periodically in order that they might use the place, but that not that they were purchasing it. So everything is set in place. Everything is ideal. There is all that is needed in a vineyard in the ancient world. And then the landowner Having rented out, he goes on a journey. He goes away. But there is still communication. There is still back and forth that takes place. Time passes, and it wasn't a week-by-week week lease or a month-by-month month in the ag 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 agrarian economy. The time in which to receive the rent was at the harvest, and such it is today when there is a crop to be taken in. So harvest time comes, and the landowner, he sends his slaves to the vine growers in order to receive that which was rightfully due to him. Problem, problem. The vine growers, instead of forking over what was agreed upon and what was due at that point. It wasn't that the slaves had come early and say, well, come back next week or come back next month. It's too, it's too early. Or, no, 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 that's not what we agreed upon as the price. It was simply, no, we're not giving you a dime. We're not doing anything whatsoever. The vine growers, Jesus says, took the slaves one was beaten, another killed, and another stoned. Not sure whether stoned to death or just stoned to be horribly injured. But three different responses are given here. The landowner is not dissuaded. He sends another group of slaves, of his servants, larger than the first, and the vine growers, they rise up and they do like to these, this next party that come, representing their master, their Lord, in order to receive what was due. I said to you that the landowner is a representation of our Heavenly Father. He had eyeballed, he had earmarked that land for the Jews. And the Jews, they were regarded not as the owners of the land. They were entrusted with a certain portion of it, but only as those who were stewards, those who were to take care of the land 
not as owners themselves, not as those who possessed it for themselves, but rather who possessed it for their Lord and Master who they served. So Jesus is painting a picture of those who have been entrusted with the land, the Jews, and honor, honor, praise, regard is due back to the Lord. And the Lord, he sends slaves. And in the Old Testament, it was his prophets who would come to the people and speak to them about the regard, the praise, the honor, the adoration that was due to their master. And so often the people, they disregarded the preachers and the prophets that were sent to them. And they were thrown aside. They were insulted, they were belittled, some of them were even killed because of the word which they spoke in the Lord's name. But the Lord was not dissuaded. He sent one party, he sent one group of his servants, and he sent another group, and he actually sent many, many groups of prophets over the centuries of the Jewish nation's history. Many times there would be that message Come back to the Lord. Give him his rightful due. You are not the ones who own this. You have been dealt with so graciously and so kindly. Why do you kick and struggle and fight against him when you know that it is to him you owe your very life? But the people were unwilling to listen, completely unwilling to listen. And so God the final straw was that he would send his son. Here we read in verse 37, he sent his son to them, to the Jews, saying, they will respect my son. But the vine growers, those who were in charge, and hear how the chief priests and Pharisees, how they felt the sting of this, how that they felt that Jesus was looking and directing his remarks straight at them. Jesus, he puts in their mouth, Come, this is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. If we just get rid of this one, we've gotten rid of the others, but here is the one who is more important than any other. Those other ones, it didn't matter how we treated them because there were others coming along after them. But here, if we take the heir, if we take this one, and if we kill him, then it will all be ours. There will be no one else to bother us. There will be no one else to whom we should pay homage, that we should give honor We'll be the big cats. We'll be the ones who are in charge. They took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. That's what took place to Jesus, taken outside of the city gate and there crucified on Calvary's hill. They took him out of the vineyard and killed him. So something is going to happen here. The owner of the vineyard who originally put all of this in place, is he going to say, well, I guess that didn't work very well? Or is he going to act? Is there going to be justice in God's economy? Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers, those who had been those wretched renters? Well, the people, they understood what should happen. They said to Jesus, he, the master, the landowner, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and he'll rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. 
that things will be as they ought to be. And Jesus, he doesn't say, yep, you've got it right. You're dead in the middle of the target and the bullseye. Jesus, perhaps he nodded in agreement, hard to see a nod through the pages of a book. But Jesus, he goes on and he refers them to Scripture as so many other times. He refers them to Psalm 118 and verse 22. Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. The one who the vine growers, those wretched renters, regarded as someone to be just tossed aside and discarded. Jesus now changes the figure and the image. He, instead of a, a farmer, he now refers to the picture of a builder. And he says, the stone which the builders rejected. They thought this one is no good for anything. There, there seems to be a bit of a flaw in it. There seems to be something that just isn't right and we're not going to waste our time trying to chisel away at it. We're just going to throw it back on the garbage heap and be done with it. Jesus says, quoting Psalms, the stone which the builders rejected, that has actually become the most important, pivotal, key stone in the whole structure. God saw in that stone something that none of the others saw. This came about from the Lord. And we, from our perspective, from our earthly vantage point, just stand back and say, it is marvelous. It is incredible. We've never seen the like of these things ever before. It is marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus, he now comes back to what was going on. He says, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you Perhaps more than just the scribes and the chief priests and the Pharisees felt the sting of this. Perhaps at this point, some of the common people of Jerusalem also drew away and said, how can we listen to him anymore? The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of of it. Fruit, both Old Testament and New Testament, is a key important point. In James and elsewhere, we read of the importance of a tree not simply looking good, but of bearing the fruit that it is supposed to bear. A tree might look healthy and well, but unless it is bearing the fruit that it is supposed to bear, it may have rot. It may have disease, which is preventing that. There may be something that is hidden and that is not obvious to every eye. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of the kingdom of God. And he who falls on this stone, coming back now to the builder imagery, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Now those chief priests, they were no dummies. They not just sensed the sting, they sensed the incense of Jesus remarks. And when they heard this parable, his parable, they understood that he was 
centering it upon them. Their consciences leaped up and they realized that they were the bad guys in the story. And they sought, they sought. And this was just one of the episodes leading to Jesus hanging upon the cross. There were many before and there would yet be more after this. But they sought to seize him. They so desperately wanted to silence him. But fearing the people who regarded him as a prophet, they held back at this point. It's easy for us to point fingers and to say, oh, what foolish, what foolish people, how blind, blind guides leading blind people, people who fall into a ditch just to be pulled out and going across the road to fall into the other side. How foolish, how foolish. Jesus, he speaks this not simply to those born, descended from Abraham. Jesus would speak this to all who feel themselves on the inside looking out. Jesus would speak this to those who have never had a drop of Jewish blood flowing through their veins. No one has ever called you a chief priest or a Pharisee. You hardly know exactly what a scribe or a lawyer in the first century did, but Jesus, he is speaking some eternal truths here in this parable about how that we have been created in the very image of God. God has provided for us he has reached out in his mercy and he has shown his great kindness to us, how do we respond? How do we respond? Do we take it to ourselves and say, oh, thank you very much. This is just great. I'll take it from here. I'll do what I want to do. Or do we honor the Lord as we ought the one who has provided for us, the one who has entrusted us with his belongings and his goods? Do we fight, kick, do we beat, and do we kill, do we stone those who are sent to us? When the Lord repeatedly seeks to reach out to us, do our hearts become harder and harder and harder? more brittle than ever before. When Jesus himself comes imploring and pleading with us, when he comes and offers salvation full and free, when he comes and says, follow after me and know life, know life abundant and everlasting, do we say, ah, if I can just silence this voice, then I will certainly, I will surely be free to go my own way. What is your response? How do you hear the words of Jesus? Sure, you might say, oh, he was a prophet. Far more than a prophet. Far more than the wisdom of King Solomon was here. Far greater a prophet than Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel combined is right before us. Far higher a king than Saul, David, Solomon, and all the rest combined. Will you come and bow before him? Will you come and give to him the honor and the allegiance that he rightly deserves. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your mercy, for the work of your spirit, and I pray that there would continue to be in each and every heart and life this cry, this pleading 
urgent necessity that people would come to the cross and live, that they would see you for who you are. The stone that the builders rejected, the one who has become the very foundation, the most pivotal, important stone in the whole structure. May our lives be built upon you, Lord, and may we honor you with our whole heart, life, our whole being, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.